Okay, so welcome <laughs> to our high school information seminar. I'm so glad you're here. Um, we are going to cover a few things today. So just uh, today's agenda, we're going to answer these three main questions. The first, what is the purpose of high school? Secondly, what do students and parents need to know and prepare now? And number three, how will we as Eastside Schools uh, help you in that endeavor? Sometimes we're kind of in the grind of things. We go to school and we come back from school, we do homework, we take tests, but we don't know ultimately, like we're not really thinking about what it's all for. But it's really important students that you guys are thinking about why you are here now. And you guys need to start thinking about the big picture. So after, so we're in high school right now. Sometimes students think that college is the ultimate goal. Once I get into college, that's it. I'll be set for life. But actually, no, it's not. It's just one stepping stone to the rest of your life. And that could be a career. That could be multiple careers. It could be a family. It could be travel. But there's so, there's so much more after, after high school, after college. So you have to remember that high school and college are just stepping stones. Stepping stones. So how will uh, you kind of, how you think about your future will de determine what you do now and so what you can make the most of. All right, so our mission, our mission as a school is to do three things, to help our students reflect and discover their interests and skills and subs uh, subsequently their goals. And then secondly, to bridge students and families to resources to help them get to those goals. And thirdly, to provide students learning opportunities in school and in our communities to understand and explore their future options. So in order to figure out what you want to do in life, you have to kind of know what happens after high school. So we're going to start with that. So what happens after high school? The ultimate goal might be to get to a career, but there are different ways to get to a career. First, you can just graduate from high school and get a job. That is possible, okay? And there are people who do that and do so successfully. And there are some people who try that and are unsuccessful in that. But one thing that I will say is if you go straight from high school to a career, first of all, the chances that you want, you're gonna live the life you want to live with the monetary uh, and also just social economic success is probably not so likely because what careers and jobs and companies are looking for are people with experience uh, and people with a resume. And usually that comes with a degree because college is just one way uh, that um, employers can see kind of your credentials. Like what kind of training, what kind of experiences have you had? And so it is possible that you can just go straight from high school to college, okay? But, I mean, sorry, not high school to a career, but most likely it'll be pretty difficult to be successful in the way that you want to be. The second option, which is just a very viable option, is to go to either technical or vocational school. There are a lot of great options for students who want to maybe pursue something more hands-on and go to school a little less, maybe one or two years instead of an academic, a traditionally academic college. The third option is to go to a two-year college. So that's what we call a community college. And in the two-year college, you can have two, two pathways. You can either go straight to a two-year college and straight to a job. You can get an associate's degree or some sort of a certificate at a two-year college and go straight into a career. The other option is to go from a two-year college to a four-year college, okay? Also, you can go to a four-year college straight from high school. So that's the other option. You can go to a four-year university. And then after a four-year university, there are students who pursue higher education, postgraduate studies. So either through certifications, graduate school, professional school. So look, look how many different options there are and different pathways to get to the career you want to get to. You don't have to take all these steps sequentially either. You might you know, start on a four-year college path and then work for a little bit, and then pursue a professional degree. You can start at a two-year college, take a break, and then transfer to a four-year college. There are a lot of different options and a lot of different pathways. But the reason why thinking about these things now is important is because you don't want to waste time. And you don't want to waste resources, right? So if you already kind of have a pathway in mind, then that'll help you figure out what you need to do next to maximize your time, your resources, and your life. So we're gonna talk about all these different things. 
Where do you want to go and why? That's a very important question you need to ask. What do you need to do to get there? And how should, what should you do now to prepare for that path? So the first question you have to ask yourself is, what do you want to do and why do you want to do it? So start actually and realistically thinking about your future now. Your future doesn't start five years from now or four years from now. You are building up to your future right now. The habits, the interests that you're building, the skills that you're devel developing, all of these things will all build up to the person you become in four, five, 10 years. And so you really wanna start thinking about, okay, where, what, where do I wanna be in 10 years? What kind of a person do I wanna be in five years? So you have to think about your aspirations. What is it that you want for yourself? What do you envision for your future? Because your pathway, whether you go to a trade school or a two-year college or a four-year college, will kind of depend on what you want to accomplish in life. All of these are stepping stones. So if you want to talk about the, the second pathway to vocational or technical schools, let me tell you, this is not a bad option. There are actually people who just ha uh, are trained in a trade that make a ton more money and live more comfortably than people who go to a four-year university. So let me just uh, highlight some, okay? So for example, plumbers, you be knock plumbers. We think, oh, it's a poopy job because they deal with poop. Actually, you know plumbers make a lot of money. Uh, right now, there is a shortage of plumbers in the world, but especially in America. And so there are plumbers who make upwards of six figures as they start. Did you guys know that? So if you really want, if money is your thing, okay, if you really want to make a lot of money, then considering vocational and technical careers that don't involve too much additional schooling is not a bad option. Electricians are also really high in demand. Electricians, we, we're running out of electricians and there are very few that are trained uh, to build houses, also to deal with uh, the different changes in technology. You don't have to go to a four-year college to be an electrician. You can go to a two-year trade school. So Consider all of these different things, okay? So if you are interested in doing anything vocationally, trade-wise, that doesn't require additional uh, schooling, then these are a lot of great options that you can consider. Even automotive technology right now, like companies like Tesla, pretty much every single automobile company is going hybrid or electric. And right now, we are at a shortage of people who can build these uh, automobiles and these vehicles. And so Tesla actually has a special school and they partner with different technical schools and two-year colleges uh, around the United States. And you have to get accepted into the program, but once you go through their program, you are Tesla certified and that's your pathway into Tesla. And you will have a set job for as long as you don't mess up too badly at the company. So these are all options that you can consider and think about if this is your pathway, and you don't want to do traditional academic schooling. But it still requires work, and it still requires money. So this is something that you have to intentionally decide to do. The third pathway is to do a two-year college. So usually these are traditionally called community colleges. There are, there are actually private community colleges as well, but usually we think about public community colleges. There are some benefits to going to a two-year community college. First of all, it's so much cheaper um, tuition-wise. It's about $1,000 or $2,000 a year versus a Cal State, which is the next cheapest option if you're looking at a four-year traditional university, which is closer to about $20,000, $30,000 uh, without any aid or scholarships. Um, also, you can still at a community college get a degree in two years. This is what's called the associate's degree. So associate's degrees usually uh, have more to do with technical skills or vocational or trade skills, but that's also a really great cheap option to get a degree. But also you can transfer from a two-year community college to a four-year community college. And this is a really good option for students who are not really sure yet what they want to study for four years in college. If they're not sure about committing to a four-year university that has a higher price tag, it's not a bad option to go the two-year route and get done with all of your general requirement classes, take some additional classes to figure out what it is that you actually want to study in college, and then transfer. Most California uh, um, 
community colleges, public community colleges, have what's called TAG, the TAG program. And this is the Transfer Admissions Guarantee Program. In this program, basically, you go for two years, and if you keep your GPA at a certain point, then you're guaranteed admissions into at least one Cal State or one UC. So this is a good option for students who maybe didn't do so well in high school the first two, three years, and then want to consider transferring uh, to a bigger college later on. So that's also an option. So the two-year college application process is super, super easy. All you need to do is graduate from high school. You have to graduate from high school to go to a community college. And then secondly, you just need to fill out a simple online application. And then you can take classes. However, there are some pros and cons to the two-year college. Uh, so first of all, the pros, uh, super affordable. There are so many local options. There's pretty much a community college at ev in every single city. The class sizes are a lot smaller. So at a community college, at most about 50 students, usually about 20, 30 students. It's an easier transition from high school because of the smaller sizes. Uh, and then also, it's a quick, a great quick two-year vocationally focused degrees. There are a lot of vocationally focused options at community colleges. So if that's kind of where you're going and not really sure yet what you want to do, it's a great place to explore, try taking some classes. This is actually not a bad option even in high school. So a lot of community colleges offer specific trade-related classes. Like you can take an automotive engineering class, you can take an intro to business class. There are some options that are not available at high schools that you can take as a high school student at a community college if you just kind of want to explore what you want to do in the future. Uh, even simple classes like anatomy or physiology, classes that are not usually offered at a public high school or even our high school, these are options that you can take at a community college even as a high school student. But there are some challenges to the two-year college. So first, uh, if you want to get a bachelor's degree or if you want to go on to graduate school, then you will need to transition to a four-year university. And secondly, it's not necessarily easy. So a lot, this is a misconception, a lot of high school students have community college as a backup plan, as a default. Oh, if anything, I can just transfer. I can mess up all I want in high school and then I can just transfer. But it's not that easy, first of all, because it's still college. Community college is still college. And secondly, community co in order to transfer from a community college to a four-year college, it's completely contingent on those two years of community college. So if they don't look at your high school GPA, they're not, they don't consider your high school GPA, they don't consider things like your uh, AP scores or your SAT scores, what they're mainly looking at only are the two years at your community college. So if you are thinking, I can mess up all I want and then go to community college in two years and then magically community college will save me, actually there is greater burden because Every semester at a community college are different sets of classes. It's not like high school where you have one class the whole year for two semesters. You take three or four classes one semester, three or four classes second semester. And then that all builds up to your community college GPA in order to transfer. But you're also at a college. So even if it's a community college, it's still harder than high school. You are competing with students who want to transfer to a, you know, four-year universities. And so you have to keep up with the rigor. And secondly, you also are not keeping in mind that you have two transitions from high school to college and then college to another college if you want to transfer to a four-year university. So if you, you so all, all of this is to say, you're not gonna, nothing is gonna be a magic fix from one to the next. What you're doing now, the study skills you build now are going to be what helps you be successful, whether it's at a community college or four-year college or a vocational college, wherever you go, you have to start living your life now and not wait for a transition to all of a sudden magically transform you. So it's really important that you're thinking about these things. Also at a community college, it's a very uh, transitional place. A lot of students are there so that they can transfer or a lot of students are there because they don't know really what to do in life. And so there's a lot of social and emotional challenges too. Unless you know and are focused and determined, you can very easily get swept up in the, you know, the waves, the ebbs and flows of transient life. And so you do need to still 
be intentional, determined, no matter where you are, but especially at a two-year you know, uh, two college. So these are the pros and cons of the two-year. The pathway to a four-year college, there are two different types of colleges. There's the public colleges. So in California, we have the Cal States, the UCs. There's an amazing uh, um, group of colleges uh, that are under the umbrella of WUI, which is the Western University Exchange Program, which I'll talk about briefly later. And then obviously there are other out-of-state public school options that are available. And then we also have private colleges. We have the Ivy League, which I'm sure you guys all know about. We'll talk about it in a little bit. We also have the non-Ivy, but super selective. We have liberal arts colleges, regional private schools. These are all options that students can choose from. But we're gonna talk about these, all these different types of colleges just kind of uh, briefly. We're gonna have a separate college application seminar for our juniors and our rising uh, seniors um, in a, a, a little bit. But, so that's why we're gonna just do teasers for right now. But this is so that you can start thinking about what are your different options? What can you start considering now as a ninth grader, as a 10th grader, as an 11th grader? We'll talk about the Cal States and the UCs first, in-state public schools. The California State University system has many options. So many Cal States, lots of lots of great options. And I do want to tell you a little bit of why the Cal State system got started in the first place. First, they wanted to give local, regional options for students. Cheap, cheaper, like affordable local options that focus more on vocational career training than the UC system. And so the Cal States are a great place for students to go if they have a specific specialized programs that they want to study for four years. So for example, Cal, uh, Cal State programs have really good engineering, business programs. Actually, Cal State business programs, a lot of them are better than UC business programs, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. They also have specific programs like teaching programs. Cal States have the best teaching programs in California. Um, there's also uh, interesting programs like engineering, I'm sorry, uh, architecture, uh, business management, hotel management, all these things that are not usually offered at the UC system are offered at a lot of the Cal States. So Cal States are great for pre-professional programs, like the ones I mentioned. And also, they're smaller than the UCs. They usually cap their classes at the most at about 50, 60, but actually most of them are at about 20, 30, depending on what program you're in. They're not too research heavy, not too academia heavy. So they don't have as many like GE, general education requirements as the UCs do. Uh, they're more focused on the practical. And also they have higher acceptance rates because they have so many, so many options. Uh, and also there are a lot of local options that you can consider. And they are definitely more affordable. They're more expensive than community college, but they're definitely more affordable than the UCs or private schools. But the one caveat to this is because Cal States were designed to uh, be accessible to local uh, communities, their first preference always is to accept students in that local region. So even for schools like Cal State San Luis Obispo, the most popular Cal State, they prioritize students that are in that region versus students that are in Southern California. So you hear all these things about acceptance rates, right? Like, oh man, Cal State Long Beach has gotten so much harder to get into. But if you're in the Long Beach region, it's gonna be easier for you to get into than if you're in Fullerton. That's just how it is, because that's what, how they were designed uh, to be. So this is a great option for students to think about if they don't wanna do too much studying. Uh, the second option is, I'm sorry, you do have to study. Too much academic studying is what I meant. Or I mean, uh, research or like general education, uh, liberal arts studies. University of California, there are 10 options. However, one of them is purely a graduate program, school, uh, graduate school only. So San Francisco is only for graduate programs. All the rest of them uh, are great options for students in California. Very, very popular, all of them. But the thing you have to know about the UCs, Look at all these different programs. There are a lot of different departments, a lot of different programs in the UC schools. Tons and tons and tons. And every UC kind of does things a little differently. There are definitely th uh, programs that are much more difficult than others, like engineering. Hands down, no matter what college you apply to, whether it's Cal States or UCs or private schools, engineering is most most likely gonna be one of the hardest departments and hardest programs to get into. But you will see that some of the programs, even like the way that they uh, 
categorize their colleges are a little different. So if you look at Santa Barbara, they only have three colleges. College of Creative Studies, which is a whole nother application process, let me just tell you. It's basically applying for a PhD program. Super cool, but really selective and super intense to get into. College of Engineering, which is one of the best engineering programs in the UC system. They only accept about 500 students per year. 500. <laughs> Crazy. And then they have everything else in College of Letters and Sciences. So not a lot to like, you know, choose from. But if you look at a school like Riverside, there are a lot of different programs that a lot of the other UCs don't have. They are the only school that has a school of business, I'm sorry, minus Irvine. They are the only school that has school of public policy. They're the only school that has school of medicine. And in the school of policy, public policy, they, there includes an education program. They're the only school in the UC system that has a set uh, pre-professional education program. Really cool. All the other UCs, you have to go to graduate school for it. There is a Bachelor of Science in Education at Irvine, but it's not necessarily geared for future teachers. It's actually more for people who want to research education. And so it's a social science, very different. So anyway, I say all this because you got to know your UCs. Don't lump them all into the same category. For example, did you know that the only UCs that actually have business as a major are Irvine, Berkeley, and Riverside. These are the only schools that have business programs that are actually have business in their name. But there are also programs at schools like UCLA, Davis, Santa Barbara that are related to business, but it's not necessarily a business degree. So that's something that you want to think about if business is what you want to pursue. There are also different pathways to programs like computer science at uh, schools like Berkeley. There are different ways to get into the different programs. Only UCLA and Berkeley offer architecture. No other UCs do. And only UCLA and Irvine have nursing. And UCLA and Irvine are the hardest nursing programs to get to. UCLA's nursing program only accepts 2%. 2%. Nuts. So you have to do your research. You have to know that not all UCs, just because they are a UC, is good for you. You have to think about what you want to do and why you want to go. That's why this has to be an intentional process. You have to think about, why is it that I want to pursue this? A lot of our students, especially in California, they feel like if they get into a UC, all of life's problems are solved. Actually, totally not true. If you go to a big university like the UCs, you are a small fish in a huge pond. And so unless you have the initiative and the drive to pursue what you want to do, take the initiative, seek out those opportunities, it's actually a place where you will flounder and not find yourself. I can tell you personally, I have a lot. So let me just tell you, from my students who apply to the UC system, I would say about a good 40, 50% of them think they're going to be doctors. I always encourage them, great, yes, go be healers. Within a year, <laughs> they're all doing something else because they realize that's not what they really wanted. As soon as they take, uh, start taking those lab science classes at a UC, they're like, mm -mm, this is not for me. Same goes for engineering. Lots of students who drop out of engineering. It's because they think they have this image. You have this image of what life is going to be in your mind. But unless you actually pursue and learn and research for yourself and understand for yourself what you want to do, you're going to continue to be lost, even if you get into a school like the UC system. The average student at a UC changes their major about two, three times. The average student. The student who doesn't change their major is the exception. Is the exception. Yeah. It's important that we are intentional. Most of our students these days are graduating high school with very, they're graduating with very little direction, very little drive, and thinking that, just getting accepted into college will solve all their problems. But it's important that you know that that's not the case. The UC recap, the big school experience, it's a great place for you to have a lot of opportunities. But sometimes for students, all the opportunities can actually be a little overwhelming. Also, really important, it's great for go-getters and proactive students. And because they have so much, uh, uh, so much facility and research opportunities and so much new technology. It is great to experience all that research um, opportunities. It's relatively affordable um, and also it's good for students who are strong leaders in smaller pockets. 
So like student associations and pre-professional programs. So these are all great options. And obviously lots of options in California. But one thing that you do want to keep in mind for the UCs, in order to graduate from a UC, uh, there are what's called, what are called GE requirements. So these are general education courses. And basically what these courses are, like most liberal arts universities, uh, they, the UCs believe that all education, okay, all education requires foundations in all subjects. So whether you're an engineering degree or a major or an English major or a math major, they have you take a set of core classes that you need to graduate. Obviously, those requirements will differ depending on what you want to study. But really, core classes like composition, social science, all of those classes, everyone will need to take. So I had a student who wanted to do uh, actuarial sciences at Santa Barbara, and he was taking, yeah, it's like a finance degree. And he was taking like, um, I was asking him what classes he was taking for his first quarter. And he was like, oh, I'm taking oceanography. I'm like, oceanography? Like, why are you taking oceanography? Because I have to fulfill my science requirement. I had another student in San Diego. He was studying something like engineering or something. And then I was asking him about his class. And he was like, yeah, I'm taking interpretive dance. I was like, what? <laughs> but it's because they have to take certain courses to fulfill their GE requirements, which is good. It's their chance to explore something that they wouldn't have otherwise. But if for you, you feel like this is a waste of time, then maybe the UCs are not a good option for you, right? So you have to know what actually it's like to go to these schools. Um, I'm going to go over the WUI and other public schools pretty quickly because the WE program is actually a really good program. Uh, there are a list of colleges on the West Coast, all the way from like Alaska to Utah, Washington, Idaho. All of these schools that are listed are schools that are part of this association where if you are an out-of-state student, you can go to these colleges paying their in-state tuition. So you can go to these colleges and you know pretty much pay the tuition that other, like let's say if I want to go to Colorado, I can go to one of the listed colleges in Colorado and pay Colorado tuition. Uh, just like in, uh, in California, we have the advantage of being California residents, so we pay in-state tuition for UCs. But unfortunately, the WE program does not include the UCs because they're very, very popular. But there are a lot of good options in other states, uh, good options to consider if you just want to go to a public school but don't want to pay out-of-state tuition. There are also other great out-of-state uh, public schools. These are some really, really good options that you can consider. Um, one of the most popular ones is UW, uh, University of Washington in Seattle. There's also one in Tacoma and Bothell. Those are much better, higher acceptance rates, but equally good schools. But these are all really good options to consider if you want to go to an out-of-state public school. However, if so this is, uh, out-of-state public schools are great options if you just want a new environment. You don't want to stay in California, but you still want the big out-of-state UC experience, or um, big public school experience. Also, for public schools out-of-state, usually the acceptance rate is a little higher than UC uh, acceptance rate, so that could be an advantage for you. Uh, and usually, they're more affordable than private schools, especially the WUI schools. However, the... P big name public schools like UMich or uh, University of Illinois or usually they do not give that much financial aid to out-of-state students, uh, even UW. And so it can become pretty costly. So for me, if you're going to go out of state to a public school, then look at the WUI system. Otherwise, unless there's a really amazing public school that has always been your dream school, I just don't think it's worth the price tag because they're still really big schools, you know? And so these are things that you can consider if you're wanting to do uh, public schools out of state. Also, for public schools out of state, especially the really popular ones like UMich, their acceptance rate for, um, or their requirements for out-of-state students is higher than in-state students. So even for UW, if you just look at their acceptance rates, you'll see that their average GPA is a 3.5, 3.4, and so a lot of California students are like, yes, I can get in. But actually, for California students, the, accept, uh, the GPA requirement is higher. So depending on what school and how popular they are, they do have higher standards for out-of-state students, just as the UCs do. The UCs have higher standards for out-of-state uh, students too. And then let's go into the private schools. Um, so you obviously know the IVs, Brown, Columbia, Cornell, Dartmouth, blah, blah, blah. And then we have, and friends, the big names, like Stanford, MIT, Johns Hopkins. 
I'm just going to say one thing about these schools. So they're amazing, and they have history. They have amazing programs, endowments, all of that stuff, lots of money. However, their acceptance rates are so ridiculous. Like Stanford, uh, acceptance rate is at about a 2% right now. If you don't, like just school-wide, uh, if you're not um, a special case. So unless you're a student athlete or underrepresented minority with extraneous circumstances, your chances of getting in are really, really minimal. And so, yes, if you really, really want to go for the big name schools, then go for it. However, are these schools going to give you that much better of an education? I'm not sure. Especially because if you look at actually, like, if you're really consider like, if you really are uh, wanting to pursue worldly success, like if you want to make the Forbes 100 list, if you look at the Forbes 100 list people, actually, if you look at where they graduated from undergrad, you'd be surprised. Like a lot of these colleges you probably haven't even heard of. But where they went to graduate school is really what matters. So you see graduates from like Harvard or Stanford for graduate school. So actually what's really important is that you really go to a college where you can thrive for those four years, find yourself, and if you find yourself wanting to pursue something more, then you can pursue specific graduate programs that will serve that purpose. So it's not really whether or not you get into these undergraduate schools that are big name schools. I don't think. Also, they're really expensive. So unless you are an underrepresented minority with extraneous circumstances, you're going to be paying a pretty hefty price tag. Also, it's not really about how great of a student you are either. So a lot of students will apply to these schools and be super bummed if they don't get accepted. Honestly, these schools are very, very particular in who they accept because they have so few seats available. So let me just give you an example. UCLA... About 20 years ago, their acceptance rate was about 40, 50 percent. Uh, 30 years ago, it was about 40, 50 percent acceptance rate. Since then, they have cut, like, dropped significantly. So if you look at their acceptance rate now, it's below 15 percent. Depending on what program, it's really, really, uh, you know, competitive to get into. However, since that time, what the UCs have done, because their programs are so popular, they have every year every few years try to expand the number of students that they include, uh, they bring in to their incoming class. So where it was about 2,000 students undergrad that were accepted, they continue to expand their program so that they can serve more and more students uh, in their incoming class. So the UCs, they really try to accommodate the demand. Stanford, their acceptance rate about 30 years ago was about uh, 20%. They were about 20%. At that time, they were accepting about 2,000 undergraduates per year. Since then, their acceptance rate has dropped to about 5%, 4%, 3%. The number of students that they take now is about 1,700. So instead of expanding to meet the demand, they have actually lessened the number of students they're bringing in. So it really does become a numbers game. And it does become, you know, like, what is it that we're really trying to do? And so... I'm not knocking Stanford, great school, great programs, but it really does make you consider what is it that you want for your child and why do you want that for your child? That's something to really think about. So there are other private schools that are also extremely selective. So when I say extremely selective, we're talking about acceptance rates uh, less than 10%. Uh, 15 or less percent. And so if you're looking at these schools, then this also means that their uh, selectivity is pretty, pretty extreme. So uh, definitely want to consider that. There are also other private schools that are still highly selective, but not extremely selective. This means their acceptance rates are about 20, 30 percent. And then we have other private schools that are moderately selective, still pretty big name schools. Their acceptance rates range from about 30 to 40 percent. So a couple of standouts in this, uh, on this list. We have schools like Baylor University, amazing program for undergraduate, but also great medical school. There's a program at Drexel University, which is in Philadelphia. They're the, actually one of the pioneers of the co-op program where students can work for a semester and gain actual uh, you know, uh, professional experience full time, get paid to do that, and have that count towards their graduation requirement. Very, very practical. Since then, another school really ran with it, Northeastern. Great, great school with great co-op programs. 
that's a really good school to consider. We have schools like University of Richmond. They're known for their research. Amazing undergraduate uh, science research, especially human biology research. So these are all really good options. American University, one of the leading uh, producers of law students and diplomats, because uh, it's right in Washington, DC. So these are really good options to consider. And then there are other private schools in California. These are kind of the more familiar ones that we might know of. Their acceptance rates are a little higher, but these are really, really good schools, private schools to consider, especially if you want a liberal arts education. A couple of highlights, I love Chapman University, one of the greatest schools in California. Just right down the street, they have really good programs in media, one of the best programs in the United States. It's a feeder school to Hollywood. They also have a great, um, uh, engineering school. They also have a pharmacy program. That's a five-year pharmacy program, fast track. So these are also great uh, 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 options to consider. There's obviously private school, private Christian school options like Biola to consider as well. So for private schools, if you want smaller class sizes with personalized academic experiences, private schools are good, especially the smaller ones that are about 5,000 uh, student population. It's usually geared towards more interactive learning uh, versus lecture-based classes. So even in smaller schools like Claremont McKenna or the Claremont Colleges, they'll do like active discussions, Socratic discussions versus just someone teaching at you, which is great. Great access to professors. Is, so if you want to go to graduate school, then going to a private school will ensure that you have that personal connection with your uh, professors to get those good recommendation letters. And then obviously more access to research and internship opportunities just because you have those personal relationships with your professors. Obviously, if you want to apply for a big name school, then you know the prestige and the reputation of those schools. But do remember the price tag. They are pretty expensive and they're expensive for a reason. So what do you need to get there? What are colleges looking for? So this pyramid kind of shows the things that the main criteria that colleges are looking for. And this is directly from colleges. So uh, I'm a part of an association called NACAC. It's basically, it's a national association of college admissions counseling. And basically it's a collection of uh, colleges and admissions officers, as well as high school counselors and other people involved in the college admissions process. And every year, we get together and we learn about the different trends in education. And so every year they do a survey. They ask colleges, what is it that you're looking for in your students? And this pyramid kind of explains uh, the ranking of importance. At the bottom, always is the academic profile. Standardized test scores, AP exams, it used to also include the SATs, but not as much now. And then extracurricular activities, personal family background, personal statements and letters of recommendation and demonstrated interest. So how are they, who's looking at what? All colleges are pretty much looking at those two factors, your academic profile and your standardized test scores. The more selective colleges, so colleges that are maybe ranked in the top 100, uh, colleges that are about 30, 40% uh, or less acceptance rate, will look at things like your extracurricular activities, they'll look more closely at your personal and family background, and usually they'll request personal statements, which are college essays. And it's actually only the super, super selective colleges, like the Ivy League and their friends, that, uh, that will require things like recommendation letters, and they want you to show what's called demonstrated interest. So we'll look at how all of these things are considered. So for the Cal States, these are the only things that are considered. They will only consider your admissions index, which is pretty much your GPA. They'll look at your GPA overall. And the GPA that they look at is just your 10th and 11th grade GPA. They will see your 9th grade classes and your GPA, but what will, only, what will be considered for your acceptance is just your sophomore year and your junior year. They will also see what classes you're taking as a senior, but unfortunately, they won't get to see your grades until after you get accepted. They also will consider your location, like I mentioned earlier. So the closer in proximity you are to that campus, the more likely you're, uh, you are to get in. Also, they'll consider, consider your major, your programs. So as I mentioned before, the professional programs at Cal States, are there are some really popular ones and more selective ones. And so if you are applying to one of those programs, uh, you know, the chances of you getting in are a little less. What they do not consider are extracurricular activities. They don't look at it at all. There's one little box for Cal State San Luis Obispo, uh, and I think Pomona added it this year too. It's a drop box. You just, do you have any extracurricular activities? Yes, no, 
That's all they ask. So they don't look for it really at all. They don't require essays. And they do not re require recommendation letters or demonstrated interest. So honestly, the Cal State application is pretty easy. And for all the Cal States, after you fill out one, you just copy and paste it to the next one, and then the next one, and the next one. So all you need to do is pay. So you can apply to all of them if you want, uh, but it's a pretty straightforward and easy application process. The UC admissions is a little more complicated. They look at what's called the academic profile. Academic profile is pretty much your GPA. They also do this really weird thing. So I'm just gonna say right now, so the UCs do what's called the uncapped versus the capped weighted GPA. Honestly, you don't need to know what they are. If you really wanna know, I can explain it to you. But it's really not necessary for you to know. All you need to know is that your GPA matters to them and how they calculate their GPA is a little different from how other uh, schools calculate the GPA. But really what they're looking for is the same thing. They do also look at your course load, like what kind of classes are you taking? They wanna see that. And also they do look for your AP scores. That also gets considered into your academic profile. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. They also look at what they call the personal profile. And your personal profile includes the following things. Your family and personal background. So they ask you questions like, how well educated are your parents? Like, what's the level of your uh, their parents' education? What is your family income? And also, just to throw this out there, a lot of parents are really scared to put how much they make on the UC application. The UC application is not FAFSA. What they're trying to see when you put the income amount on the application, they just want context. How much resources did the student have access to? That's all they're looking for. The financial department does not see the application, like they're not using that to consider you for financial aid. So please be honest in that section. Uh, and then also they're looking at things like what's your first language? If Do you have any extraneous circumstances in your life? They also do look at your extracurricular activities. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that later. And they do require essays. And they are also looking at you, depending on what program you're applying for or your major, it will be a little more selective um, if you are applying to the more selective programs. What's not considered, okay, so there's a caveat to this. UCs usually do not require recommendation letters, at least on the application. If you are kind of like a borderline student, they can ask for a recommendation letter after the fact. So if you're like, I don't know about you and we just wanna hear from your teachers, then they'll request it afterwards. Uh, so that is possible. Honestly, they don't wanna deal with it because there are so many students who apply to the UCs. Crazy numbers. UCLA has about 120,000 applicants. UC Irvine is the second most. They had over 100,000 this year. So they don't wanna read 100,000 recommendation letters. So that's why they would prefer not to, but they will if they are wondering about the students, um, you know, other parts of their lives. And they do not consider demonstrated interest. So demonstrated interest is pretty much you telling the colleges how much you wanna to go to their school. So, you know, like for example, for a lot of private schools, it is important for you to open their mail. So if you don't open their email, they can, some colleges check if you've clicked on it or not. UCs do not care. They do not have the manpower to check demonstrated interest. So no matter how many times you visit their school, it's not gonna count towards, you know, it's not gonna, you know, count favorably towards you. So don't worry about demonstrated interest. But most of the UCs do what's called holistic review. What this means is they're not looking at any one thing in isolation. They want to make sure everything is understood in context. And so they're not just going to emphasize your academics. They're not just going to emphasize your personal family background. Uh, they're, wanting, they're wanting to look at everything holistically. The exception to this are Riverside, Merced, and Santa Cruz. They're the only three schools that kind of still weigh more heavily on academics than the other parts, but most of the UCs all the UCs technically do holistic, uh, and so it is important that you're hitting all of these things if you're looking at those colleges. Private school admissions, what's considered? 
everything. <laughs> they look at everything. Everything matters. And holistic review is really what they do. Because they're smaller schools, they're not getting as many applicants. And so they want to look at every single part of your application as thoroughly as they can. So for example, for the UCs, they have about one or two readers who go through the initial reading and then they just make a decision uh, like in their committee. For private schools, usually they have two people reading the same application at the same time. They give it a score and then it moves on to committee and then it moves on to final decisions. So they do look at things more thoroughly, especially the more selective the college. Um, and so they do consider everything. So uh, the first thing that we're going to talk about is the academic profile. The GPA and the course load, what does this really mean? So for your GPA, they're looking at two, OK, so we first of all, weighted versus unweighted GPA. Honestly, what you want to look at, students, is your unweighted GPA because Really what it comes down to is, are you a mostly A student, B student, C student? And you're trying to see trends in your grades. So even if you have a 4.0, if it's all Bs and all AP classes, you're a straight B student, OK? So what they really want to understand about you is what trending grade, or what grades are you trending? And why that's important is, are you a master or are you a mediocre? That's what they want to know. The more selective the college, the more that matters to them. So when it comes to weighted GPA, why does the weighted GPA matter? Because what weighted GPA shows is that you are taking higher level courses. That's what they want to see, the weighted GPA. But really what it comes down to is what are the grades you, are you uh, what grades are you receiving in those classes you're taking. Also, 9th grade, 11th, 10th grade and 11th grade GPA versus just 10th and 11th grade GPA. Good news is 9th grade is usually not as much weight as the other two years of high school. And the reason why this is is because ninth grade is usually a transitional year for a lot of students. They're getting the hang of high school. There are a lot of things that happen during that transition. So what they're really looking at is 10th and 11th grade GPA. Also, a lot of private school, even if they look at ninth through 11th grade GPA, what they're focusing on is the 10th and 11th, because that's really when you start taking the higher level courses, and they want to see how well you're faring in those classes. Senior year grades, so Jason will be happy to know that they actually don't see your senior year grades. However, however, they will eventually see it once you get accepted or if you're waitlisted or if you're a borderline student around the admissions time. So, but what do they want to see for your senior? So you cannot flunk classes your senior year, especially the required courses. And it is, it is important to keep your grades up because even if you get into the college, if you flunk your classes, they will rescind the decision. It's always, you're always accepted on a probationary basis. Um, ranking, our school does not rank. So you don't have to worry about that. Also, course load. So what are they looking for for your course load? They're looking at what academic classes are you taking, what non-academic classes are you taking. And if you're a college, what classes do you think they'll want to see more of? Academic? because they want to know how ready you are for college, okay? So if you're like, you have four, uh, you have seven classes, but like four of them are like ASB, yearbook, music, art, and then you only have three academic classes, even if your GPA is like a 4.2, it's not gonna look very good because what are you getting ready for? Unless you're applying as a music student, unless you're applying as an art student, what really matters to them is what classes you're choosing academically. Also, they are looking at what num oh, how many college level or AP level courses are you taking? Because AP level courses and honors classes usually are preparatory college prep classes, classes that are preparing you for higher level work. They also do want to see consistency with stated interests. So if you say, I want to be an English major, at you know, UCLA or Irvine or whatever, and then you take regular English all four years when you had the option of taking AP English at, in your school. What they see is, um, you know, are you sure that you want to study English in college? Because you chose not to take the higher level classes in high school, right? So it is important that you are choosing your classes consistent with your stated interest. Also, they are looking for progression per year. They want to see growth. As should you. As a student, don't you want to be growing and improving and expanding your horizons? If you are choosing the easiest classes so that you could just get by, colleges see that right away. So they want to see that you are continuing to challenge yourself, even if it means sacrificing your grades a little bit, not flunking it, but 
you know, you want to, the appropriate challenge is better to show than no challenge at all. So don't shy away from taking AP classes because you feel like it'll plummet your grades. That's actually not what colleges want to see. Colleges want to see students who are continuing to grow academically. And last but not least, senior year classes. Senior year grades, you, they will most likely not see, but senior year classes, they will. And they consider it very important. Why? What they're looking for is growth and progression. So if you took all these hard classes, 10th grade, 11th grade, and then in your 12th grade classes, you're taking like all regular classes or really easy filler classes, then they see what you're doing. Very, very clearly, you're trying to take the easy way out. They don't want to see that. And in fact, if you think about it logically, your senior year classes are the most important for you. Why? Don't you want to go to college and be successful in college? If your goal is just to get into college and that's it, then fine. But if your goal is to get into college and succeed in college, you want to make sure that you're ready for college level classes. Do you know that at a UC, the percentage of students that are on academic probation is astounding? There are like 30, 40% of incoming freshmen who, are, who get put on academic probation because they don't know how to study. They get to college, they realize it's really, really tough, and they can't survive. Don't be that number. Be ready for college by taking college-ready classes. So for your GPA, what they're really looking at is they want to see how capable you are. They are trying to me measure your capability. For your course load, what they want to see is your curiosity and your drive. So what kind of courses are you choosing to take? How is this building you up uh, and preparing you for higher level work? Finding the right balance is really important. I'm not telling you to take only AP classes every year. That is also not a good idea because you have to make time to do other things and also you wanna live and breathe and sleep, right? So you wanna make sure you know yourself and know what you can manage and what you can handle. Because at the end of the day, if you are an unhealthy person, no matter what college you get into, no matter what career you have, it's gonna mean nothing, right? So you have to know yourself and find the right balance. If you don't know what that right balance is, that's what I'm here for, that's what uh, our school is here for. So for our school, these are the requirements for our students, high school academics, English, math, science, social science, Bible. And here's kind of the uh, requirements per year. Uh, and I'll give you guys a copy of this as well. For, but for, for at Eastside, Bible is required all four years. Cal State's, UCs, and highly selective colleges, none of them require Bible classes. We do because we love Jesus. And we want you to leave high school knowing Jesus, okay? Uh, but that's the requirement for us. And then we also have mathematic requirements. You have to take up to three years of uh, math. Um, four years is really what's recommended, okay? For uh, Cal States and for UCs, and definitely for highly selective universities, they want to see four years. The official requirement for Cal States and UCs is up to Algebra 2. That's the official requirement. But also, the GPA requirement at a UC is a 3.0. Very, very unlikely that you'll get into any UC with the 3.0. What the base requirement is, is not what, you're, what they're looking for. They want to see students who are continued to strive and excel in all different coursework. Science, you have to take three years at Eastside Christian Schools. Two of them must be either biology, chemistry, or physics. And that's actually the requirement at UCs as well. So please uh, keep that in mind. And you can, it can be a combination. It can be bio, AP bio, chem, AP chem. You don't have to take physics at all. But it has to be two years or three years of it have to be a combination of biology, physics, or chemistry. English is required all four years. Do you know why? Reading and writing is the main mode of communication in life. So if you can't read, if you can't write, you can't survive the world. So it's important. You got to do it. Four years for all, wherever you go. Uh, language other than English, uh, we do require two, of the, uh, two years of the same language. If you are looking at the more selective UCs, also highly selective universities, private schools, then they do want to see three years. Uh, actually, for private schools, highly selective, sometimes they want to see four. Social science, three years is required for us. World history, U.S. history, U.S. gov, one semester of U.S. gov, one semester of econ economics. Um, for Cal States and UCs, it's actually just two years. Uh, for highly selective universities, it's four years. So for UCs, it's actually 2.5 and Cal States too. It's world history, US history, and one semester of US government. That's what they want to see. But 
Yeah. And then visual and performing arts, one year is required for us and for everybody else. PE is required for us. You see that none of the colleges require it. We require it because we want you to be healthy people. Okay? And then uh, Cornerstone. So starting next year, all of our ninth graders are going to be required to take a class called Cornerstone. All other students who have a 3.0 or below this year will be required to take Cornerstone next year. Cornerstone is basically a class that will help our students with study skills, time management, life skills, communication skills. Also a great way to keep our students accountable at school. So it's a class that meets once a week with the teacher in charge of your academics that will help you through these very, very important skill sets, building these really important skill sets. We have seen it again and again and again. We really wish we had it this year. Our students might be smart. They don't really know how to act it or live it or live life, in fact. So it's, it's really important that we help guide them through that. And so that's why this class is going to be uh, a requirement for our junior high school students, our ninth grade students, as well as for any student that goes below a 3.0 at any given year in high school. Visual performing, I'm sorry, uh, uh, and health. Health, we do require a semester of it. Honestly, you can just take it online over the summer. I can talk about it in a little bit. Electives, we don't have a set number. But here are the classes that our, uh, or our school will offer next year. Lots of options. We'll give this out to you. I'm not going to. Um, so let me actually just go through this really quick with you. The different tracks that you can take. Uh, really, it's a progression, right? So what we want to see in our students is if you start with regular English in ninth grade, we want to see you jump up to English honors as a 10th grader, maybe even AP English as an 11th grader. But even if you take all regular classes until your junior year, you can still jump to AP Lit as a senior. So we have opportunities for our students to continue growing or developing their academics uh, in, their different, uh, in the different categories. And we also will be offering more electives next year that also could be taken online through a study hall class, an actual class, uh, instead of them taking it on their own uh, at home or just checking in with us once a week. So these are all the different options. We'll get it out to you. Our high school students are actually going to go through course selections uh, in the next few weeks. And so uh, we'll keep you posted about all this. This is actually the form that we're going to help your students fill out. So every year, we're going to keep track of what classes they should be taking, and we'll do four-year planning with them. Uh, so we'll kind of give you a trajectory of what classes they'll be taking for what subjects. And then we can always adjust and amend as we go, but this is what we're going to do starting this year for next year in preparation for next year. So all of this to say, what really colleges want to see and what you should want to see in your life is progression and growth. Because progression and growth in your academics is what shows how ready you're going to be for college and life. So you have to think about it that way too. Not trying to get the easiest classes so you can get the most A's. You have to be thinking about what classes are going to actually prepare me for higher level education and for life. And that should be your priority, not just easiest shortcuts to get to what I think would be best for me. And for colleges, context is everything. So uh, every college will look at uh, what's called a school profile. So for the UCs, they have a database of schools and they kind of, you know, these are the courses we accept from your school. They do that just you know, in, on one big massive platform. For all private schools and out of state public schools, our school has to submit one of these, which is a school profile. And it's basically, I write it. I say, this is what our school is like. This is the courses that we offer. This is kind of our demographic. And we give them context. And based on the context we provide, they will match all the academics, extracurriculars, and they make sense of everything. So the school profile is something that we do. But the reason why I show this to you is because it's not just what students do. It's also colleges are trying to understand the whole student, external factors as well as internal factors. OK, so as miscellaneous questions, we're actually going to skip over these and we can maybe talk about later. We're going to talk about standardized tests real quick. SATs, ACTs, do I have to take them? AP exams, do I have to take them? The question really is, uh, what is actually necessary? So let's think about this. For colleges, the UCs and the Cal States, SAT or ACT are not going to be considered at all 
Cal States and UCs are now what they call score-free. And this has been many years in the working. This isn't just because of COVID. They've been talking about this for ages. What they're going to do really, I don't know. It's kind of, I worry about the UCs because they have a huge task ahead of them without the SATs or ACTs. But they don't look at it at all. Score-free. So not even for scholarships, not even for grants. So if you're just looking at UCs and Cal States, you don't need to worry about the SATs or ACTs at all. Um, it might be optional, but there are also other options that you can take if you're an international student. And that's only to check your language proficiency. AP exams are not required. I said yes, but it's not required. But they do want to see it in context of your school classes. So the one thing I want to make clear for everyone watching this later too, just the AP exam score does nothing. It does not really help your students' chances of getting into college. What they want to see is that a student was able to take an AP level class all year and survive it. That's really what they want to see. So what they want to see is the course rigor, not that you're just smart and could take an exam. So it's really important that if you're going to take uh, an exam, that you're taking the class as well and getting a good grade in that class. That's also something that you want to think about. Even if you get, if you get like C's in the AP class and then you're like banking on getting that five, honestly, what's going to weigh more heavily are the C's in the class, not the AP exam score. So try your best on the AP exam, but it has to be a progression. It has to be consistency in the class itself. Also, please don't just study for the AP exam itself because you're just wasting your time, to be honest. The AP exam is actually not, I don't know why I phrased it like this, it's actually not required by any college you apply to. No college requires AP exam scores. They just wanna see it in context of your classes at school, okay? So if you are taking an AP class, you better take the AP exam, because unless you have an exam, like the AP exam exists to verify your grade in class, because a lot of public schools, I mean, not to knock public schools, but there are a lot of teachers who teach the AP class and get, give their students good grades, but you know, when they take the exam, they weren't really teaching the, to the standards of the test, uh, to the mastery of the subject. And so it is really important that not only do you have the grade in the class, but also you can verify it with that standardized test score. So it has to match up. Everything has to match up. They're looking at everything in context. For selective private schools, SATs or ACTs, right now everyone is what's called test optional. It's kind of annoying, but really what this really means is it could be a part of the admissions process. Let me just tell you right now, though, most of the highly selective colleges, they really want to bring the SATs and ACTs back. But what getting rid of the SATs and ACTs has done is it has helped increase application numbers, which helps their selectivity, <laughs> higher numbers, lower acceptance rates, better reputation, uh, and also it gives them more options to choose from. But most of the private schools want some sort of stand a standardized test because it's so hard to gauge with all the different schools that are out there. And so actually even schools like BU, uh, BU actually they, this year they said about 40-50% of their applicants submitted SAT scores. Yale, Stanford, uh, I think about 75%, 80% of applicants submitted SAT scores. So most students are still taking it and, and um, submitting it for the highly, highly selective colleges, uh, especially if you're applying to selective departments like engineering or business or architecture uh, or nursing. Uh, these programs do like to see uh, standardized test scores because it helps them decide. It's an easier way. It's one more factor that they can consider. Also, uh, a lot of private schools will consider your SAT and ACT scores for financial aid. So it can be advantageous if you're applying to a lot of private schools, but it's not the end all. It has to make sense with the rest of your application. So if you have like a 1600 on your SATs, but you're a straight C student, what do you think is gonna weigh more? Your grades in school. Because what they wanna know is what type of a student are you? A lot of smart people are smart. That doesn't necessarily make them good students. And college is school, so they want to see good students. AP exams is a must. You, if you're applying to private schools, selected private schools, you have to show them that you are capable of taking AP classes and also doing well on the exams. But you will most likely not have it count towards college credit. 
So a lot of students mistake this. So for UCs, they are very generous with AP credit. The more AP exams you've taken, the more you can get those GEs out of the way. But for private schools, they will probably not count even your fours and fives towards major requirements. And the reason why is because private schools want you to take classes at their school. They don't want you to take it anywhere else. And they don't want to give you credit for things that you've done in high school. So that's the reason why. But it will still be a huge factor in your acceptance. And always remember, holistic review. At Eastside, AP classes are strongly encouraged for students pursuing higher education. So if you're looking at any four-year university, even two-year uh, two colleges, we strongly uh, encourage you to take classes, not just for college admissions. Yes, it'll help for college admissions, but most, more importantly, it'll just help you get ready for college-level work. That's why we encourage it. AP classes are taught using AP course material directly from College Board. They're the people that write the tests. AP exams are mandatory for all students who are taking the AP classes, and we're going to be much more strict about this next year. It's not going to be like this year where students can opt out of it willy-nilly. You're going to have to stick to it if you signed up for the AP class. Also, AP preparations happen at our school. Practice tests, office hours, all of these are ways that we prepare you for the AP exam. Our AP students are actually already taking practice AP exams right now, and all of their tests are in AP format. So it is not necessary. This is one way we will save you money. You don't need to send them anywhere else. We will help you with your AP exams. As long as students are maximizing their time here and the resources we provide, they will do well in their AP exams. Also, PSATs, we have them start in eighth grade. Eighth grade and ninth graders will take PSATs this year. Our 10th graders already took it. Our 11th graders will take it to be considered for MNSQT, which is a scholarship program. So in 11th grade or 12th grade, if they want to take the ACT or SAT, we will advise students based on their college plans, but it's not going to be a surprise because we'll have a track record of how they've been doing for the past few years. And so it's not going to be like, oh my gosh, we have to all of a sudden have them study for the SATs. It's going to be, okay, well, this is how you've been doing. This is the likelihood of you getting whatever score. So it'll be much more of an easy, fluid transition in studying for the tests. So we will take care of this part for you too. Okay, extracurricular activities, personal statements, recommendation letters. I'm gonna try to get through this as fast as I can. You have to think about how colleges are looking at these things. Extracurricular activities is what we'll start with. What does that even mean? What do colleges look at when they're looking at extracurricular activities? On the Common App, which is the most popular application platform for private schools and out-of-state public schools, there are about 800 colleges on Common App that use Common App. These are the categories that are uh, on their extracurricular list. So I highlighted the ones that are more academic or intellectually related, but these are all the different things that students can be doing in high school that they can categorize or label uh, in their college application. This also means that students that are applying to colleges are engaging in this wide range of extracurricular activities. First of all, you don't need to do all these things. <laughs> don't be overwhelmed. They actually only allow 10 spots on the common application, 10 spots. So it's not like you have to do all of these, but these are the type of things that students need to be engaging to themselves, that that's what they're expecting from their students. For the UC application, they have six main categories. Uh, our award honors, uh, educational preparation programs, extracurricular activities, other coursework that's not PE that you're taking outside of school, not for credit, volunteering and community service, and work experience. So what colleges want to know really is what and how are you learning beyond your school requirements? Are you doing basic minimum or are you going beyond it? Secondly, how are you spend, spending your free time and your resources? They want to know. For all of those categories, they ask you how many weeks a, a year do you spend in that activity? How many hours per week do you spend on that activity? Do you hold any leadership positions? What do you do? You have to describe it in your own words. Okay? So it's not just, I play tennis, the end. Like they want to know, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing? Why does this mean something to you? They want to understand you and why you're doing it. Is it just to have a resume or is it because this is what you're interested in and what you're talented in and how you like to spend your time? Do all of these activities have to do with what you want to do in the future? No. 
It could just be something you do as a hobby. Just because you have art classes every week doesn't mean you're going to be an artist. It's just what are you doing to spend your, your time, right? If spending your time, how you spend your time matters to colleges, it should matter to you. How you spend your time at home or outside of school should matter to you. More than it matters to these colleges. Also, they're looking for quality, not quantity. So the UC application allows for 20 spaces. <laughs> Don't be overwhelmed. It's because there are a lot of super achieving, high achieving students. But honestly, even if you fill up those 20 spaces, if none of the things that you're doing are meaningful, it's not gonna, it's not gonna matter. They wanna see quality, not quantity, okay? So even if it's five things you're doing, if you're amazing at it, and if you're thriving in it, and they see your heart in it, then that'll matter much, much more than having just random 20 things. At Eastside, we offer a lot of leadership opportunities because we're so small. Every student can be a leader in something, and they should, because you can, right? Find something you love to do. We have athletics. We're hoping to have badminton next year. We're really hoping for it. Uh, we are also uh, really wanting to expand our arts programs uh, and programs that relate to creativity. So next year, what we're really excited for is a year-round dance team. We're actually hoping to transform one of our rooms so that it has mirrors on one wall. So we can just have a one, like a year-long dance room for our students. Also, we are going to start a media production program. So journalism, uh, social media, YouTube, uh, ways that students can use media platforms to share information. And then obviously we have uh, our leadership programs like peer tutoring, ASB. One other advantage is that service hours are part of our requirement at our school. This is not to force, well, kind of, it's to force students to get out there and see the world beyond our school walls. Invest in something that's not immediately in front of you, right? And maybe at first we need to nudge them a little bit, but once they get a taste of it, students get to see uh, what's out there and how they can play a role in this world. We also have missions trips. So this year we're taking five seniors to Cuba. Next year we're hoping to take more high school students, not just seniors. So we actually have a trip in the works. And we hope to expand this to our junior high school as well. But we just want our students to understand that God's world is a big world. And we can love and serve anybody anywhere because our God is a big God. And we have room for creativity and growth. You guys honestly can start whatever you want to start here. Well, actually not whatever. But most of your ideas, if you run it by me, if it's a good idea, we'll start it. Ms. Sharon loves to say yes. I love saying yes. So if you suggest it, we can run with it as long as you have a plan for it, okay? So come and be creative. Come and propose things. Take initiative, and we'll make it happen. Okay, the la uh, another part of your, uh, per uh, your personal profile is your personal statement. These are essays. These are called personal, uh, per these are college essays. I'm just gonna give you some examples of the type of essays that you have to write. So this is uh, from Pomona College, which is one of the Claremont Colleges. They ask you in more, no more than 150 words, uh, like this first question, at Pomona we celebrate and identify with the number 47. Share with us one of your quirky personal family or community traditions and why you hold to it. What? <laughs> right? They ask a lot of questions that search you and want to understand you. Every college question kind of gives you an insight into that college's characteristic and personality. So it is important for you to read through these college essays and see if you read this question and you're like, I, I don't even know how to answer that question. This is not a question I want to answer then maybe this is not the college for you, right? Uh, Brown, also always very exciting uh, school. They ask about the open curriculum because they want to understand if you know about their school or not. This is um, Boston University, uh, Boston College. They give you a list of questions that you can answer, but let me just, like, let's read that one, right? So, uh, Socrates stated that the unexamined life is not worth living. Discuss a time when reflection, prayer, or introspection led to clarity or understanding of an issue that is important to you. What a profound question, right? If you want to go to Boston College, this better be a question you can answer, or it's not a good fit for you. Stanford's questions are crazy, but one of them is, Stanford's community is deeply curious and driven to learn in and out of the classroom. Reflect an idea or experience that makes you genuinely excited. 
about learning. Are you excited about learning? Yeah, you should be. They want you to be, right? These are just some examples. So many, like uh, USC's, uh, this is their engineering school. Is a diverse group of unique engineers. Describe how your contributions may be distinct from others. Please feel free to touch on any part of your background, traits, skills, experiences, challenges. If you don't know yourself, how are you gonna write these essays? You have to start reflecting. You have to start getting to know yourself better or else there's no way you can tell other people about it, right? Oh, this is another Stanford question. Tell us about something that is meaningful to you and why. Such a good question. Parents, can you answer that question? So good. These are some of the UC questions. Describe an example of your leadership. What is your greatest skill or talent? Okay, so this one is so funny. I have students who will say like, um, I'm really, really good at playing video games. Great. How have you demonstrated that? How have you cultivated that? How have you shown, what, what have you got to show for it? So I actually had a student one year who was actually like a diamond level League of Legends player. Super good, apparently. I don't even know what that meant. But he was like, yeah, I'm like, I'm in the top like thousand people in the world who play League of Legends. And I was like, okay, that is actually pretty impressive. So let's write about that. But most of the time when students say I'm good at video games, it's just, I play it a lot, which is fine. I'm not knocking video games. It could be a good way to relieve your stress. But if that is the only thing you have to say about your greatest skill or talent, first of all, you need to let other people speak life into you. You're good at something else and you're not listening. And secondly, don't you wanna know more of what, you're, what you have inside of you, right? Because God created you to be an amazing person and you have gifts and I hope you cultivate it. So these are some questions. Think about an academic subject, subject that inspires you. So if you just say, I love biology because I love Ms. Hom. <laughs> That's fine. But what they really want to know is, what have you done with that interest? I love biology so much that in this experiment, I did this and this and this. And then I took this experiment home and I did this with my little brother to find out more about it. Or I went to El Salvador and I continued my research and learned about this indigenous species. That's what they want to know. What are you interested in and how have you expanded that interest outside of school? What have you done to make your school or your community a better place? Oh, man, these are good questions, aren't they? They want to know about you and how you, who you are as a person and what you're choosing to spend your time in and how you want to see yourself develop. And these are not set in stone questions. So if you say, I love biology, and in your personal statement you say, I want to maybe become a doctor, they're not going to come back to you four years later and say, ooh, you changed your major. No. They just want to know, what are you interested in right now and how are you taking initiative? Because that drive that you have right now, even if you change your mind, you'll continue to have that drive in the future. That's what they want to understand. So even if it's not for this thing, you weaving and turning to find the right path for you, they want students that are that pursuant. That's the idea behind it, okay? Um, even for this one, this is Biola's questions. Describe how and may, when you made the decision to follow Jesus. You know what? This question, man, as we were doing this with our college, our seniors this year, I cried so many times. Such hard, deep questions. So good. It really helps you understand who you are and who you are in this world and in context to yeah, your understanding of how God sees you, you know. Um, spiritual, recent spiritual growth. Are you growing at all? We actually had some really honest answers. Students saying, actually, I don't think I'm growing right now, but I want to, you know. Um, and obviously, there are questions that ask about uh, why you want to go to the college. If your answer to why do you want to go to BU is because it's a famous school, <laughs> they're going to disqualify you right away. They want to know that you know the school. They want to know that you have researched them enough. It's like if you ask out a girl, right? If you just say, or a boy, if you, I don't know if girls do that these days. But if you're just like, I want to take you out to dinner. Why? You know, because you're popular and you're pretty. Like, what kind of, maybe it's flattering for a second, but that tells nothing about you, right? 
If you say like, oh man, it's because I saw that book you're reading. I read that book too. I really like it. And it's like, oh my gosh, you get me, right? Same thing for colleges. Colleges want to know that you get them. So you have to research and you have to know what you, why you want to go to that school. So at Eastside, we offer comprehensive counseling about all of this kind of stuff all year round. This is my background. This is what I spent my last 15 years doing in my life. I love this stuff. I love helping our students realize their potential, figure out their pathways. This is what I love to do. You are, I am accessible to you at any time. You just need to make an appointment. But uh, at least twice a year, especially for 11th graders, we'll meet. And then for college applications, we help you with the whole shebang, everything. Application, essays, FAFSA. You don't have to pay another extra dime. We will help you because we want to and we want to bless you in this way. So you can if you want to go elsewhere. You can, you know, it's up to you if you want to spend thousands of extra dollars for, you know, extra stuff. But you don't have to. We're here to help you with it. Uh, we really want to help you with your post-high school counseling. So whether that's college or career or tech school, whatever it is, we want to help you get to your next stage in life. It's not just, it doesn't end for us when you graduate high school. And we want to focus on intentionality and meaning. We really want our students to know that they have a purpose in life. God has created you for a reason. And we want to bless you by helping you cultivate those gifts and talents. And we focus on the why behind the what. Not just that you have to go to college, but why do you want to go to college? What do you want to get out of it? How is this going to be a blessing to your life and to others around you? Recommendation letters, okay, so for students who are considering private schools, these are some of the things that teachers have to say about students. The reason why this is important to them is because they want to know what other people are saying about you. So these are real questions that teachers are asked. They have to rank them. Uh, what is the level of creativity or original thought in the student? Uh, very little, likely, uh, or kind of one out of ten, uh, you know, one of the best students I've ever had. They want to know, like, where do you fall in that in the classroom? Because they want to know what kind of a student you are in the classroom. They even ask about work habits. They ask about your quality of writing. They ask about intellectual promise. They ask how you are relationally. They ask about your motivations and your goals. Why do they care about this stuff? Because they want to know what type of students they're bringing onto their campus. It's important for them. And it should be important to you. Students, it should be important to you what kind of a person you are in the classroom. So if you're always grumpy all the time and coming to class, just like, don't want to do this, don't want to do this, oh, why do I have to do this? Your teachers cannot write a meaningful recommendation letter for you, or else you're going to be asking them to lie. You have to care about the person you are every single day and how you are expressing yourself and the way that you're holding yourself to the people around you. It's very important. God wants you to be a good steward of the character he has given you. It matters. At Eastside, recommendation letters are really easy because every teacher knows every student by name. We know you. We even know your boba orders. I know your shirt sizes, right? Your principal is your college counselor. Man, I write some pretty good recommendation letters. I love writing recommendation letters because it's a, an, a way for me to just brag about you guys to the world. Um, up-to-date information, we are always researching. I go to conferences every year. We're getting always the up-to-date information through NACAC, ACSI, which is what we're accredited through, UC conferences. We do our homework, and I don't want to give you any wrong information. I consider it a really big responsibility. So we will always, always try to have the most updated information. As much as you guys need to do your job, I am here to do my job, and you can trust that I will always, always try to. Okay, so holistic review. Remember, it, they're looking at all of these different things. All of these different things matter. The one component that I didn't talk about is institutional priorities. So every college has their own needs too. And that's not re relevant to any of you, but they just have to decide based on what they need. So for example, if a college is opening up a new engineering school, that year they're gonna take a lot more engineering students. If a school just recently opened a humanities library, they're gonna take more humanities students that year. It doesn't have anything to do with you. It's their institutional priorities too. So there are factors that are not dependent on you. That's why 
When you get rejection letters, please don't be that sad. This is not a determination of your value or worth. It's a transactional thing, you know? Your identity has to be grounded in God. It's who God tells you you are, not what college you get into or what your friends think about your acceptances. If you have your identity contingent on what colleges you get accepted into or what kind of job you have, you're going to be super unhappy for the rest of your life. Please, know who you are first, okay? Okay, what should you do now? There is a future full of hope and potential for you. So whatever your goal is, you must be willing to work hard, grow and learn, and adapt. These are very, very important things that you need to learn how to do. Because anywhere you go, whether it's college or career, what every person who is hiring you or accepting you want to know is, did this person maximize his or her educational and life opportunities? If you're a person that squanders their wealth, no one wants you. No one will. They want people who are going to take the resources and gifts they have and make the most of it. Every employer, every college, these are the type of people. God, he talks about the parable of talents, right? Don't squander your opportunities. High school expectations, everything's going to increase. Do you know why? Because you are increasing and you are growing. If you expect things to get easier and easier, you are expecting too little of yourself. If you're growing physically, why shouldn't you grow intellectually? Why shouldn't you grow in your capacity and responsibilities? Right? You should be growing in all these ways. So if your attitude is, dang it, I don't want to do more, I don't want to do more, I don't want man. Those are talents being given to you, resources being given to you that you're choosing to throw away. Don't do it. At home, we hope that parents are going to model a mindset of exploration and wonder and hope, not just, you better get into college or else. <laughs> you know, Please, if you're excited and if you want to give hope, to, if you give hope to your students and if you are modeling wonder and excitement, it'll be contagious to your students too how are you talking about school just get through it just go you have to go or is it man aren't you excited to learn something new today it's all about your tone it's all about your attitude if you're not modeling it for them how will they how are you expecting you uh, them to model it right or how, how are you expecting them to live it right what are biblical expectations versus worldly expectations let's focus on character not outcome and let's talk about the why not just the what don't just say, get your homework done. Talk about why you should get your homework done. Don't just say, you better go and sign up for that leadership thing. Talk about why they should, right? Always the why behind the what. Be clear and kind in your communication to each other. Parents to students and students to parents. If you're not appropriately emphasizing academics, not too hard or not too little, then your students are going to be very confused about your expectations for them. Please, let's focus on effort, not necessarily outcomes. And let's encourage, encourage, encourage on repeat. And let's limit transitions. Let's create healthy rhythm, rhythms that work for everybody. Not just enforcing it on our students, but us living it out ourselves. Because their healthy rhythms are super important for healthy success. So students, let's engage and grow intellectually, socially, emotionally, and physically. And let's explore and discover things for yourselves. So academically, let's maximize your potential. Know your strengths, but also let's work on your weaknesses. Let's maximize your resources. What does that mean? You have to learn to ask for help. Learning to ask for help is one of the most important skills you will learn in life. It's so important. I learned it too late. I wish I had learned it when I was your age. Communicate, reach out, and receive. Dude, so many people want to just love on you guys. I see so many of you guys just pushing it away, not wanting it. Man, receive it. It'll be good for you, I promise. Maximize your time. You have to know yourself. Accountability is a good thing. Discipline yourself if you don't want to be disciplined by others, okay? If you don't want people in your ear. Just you do it, and the people won't be in your ear, right? And always remember your why. Are you doing it for you, 
Don't do it for anybody else. Well, do it for you and God, okay? Search and explore. This is your life that God has given you. So make the most of it. Spiritually, you got to be well, body, mind, and soul. You have to try to search for where you are. What is your place in this life, in this world? And then invite God into it. How much do you guys invite God into things, in your decisions, in your prayers, in your struggles? God, I'm struggling. God, I don't really know what I want to do with my life. Invite God into it, and he will speak, and he will guide. Sometimes it's not a clear-cut answer, but with that wrestle comes a closeness to God. Invite others into it. Your parents want to love you and help you. Your aunties and uncles and grandparents all want to love you and help you. I want to help you. Let me help you, <laughs> okay? Your teachers want to help you. Let us help you. <sighs> and think about who you want to be in your daily life. Think about it every day as you're walking around school. Am I the person I want to be today? Check yourself and live out who you want to be every day. And physically, please allow yourself to grow. Have a physical outlet. It's important that you move around, especially at this time in your life. Be mindful of these things called hormones that make you go up, nope, down, up, down, up. Be cognizant of it, okay? It's all a part of life, understanding it, how to manage it sleep cycles and eating habits. If you're not eating regularly, you're not going to grow. And you're not going to be healthy. If you're not drinking water, you're not going to be healthy. These are essential things that your body needs. God has created us that way. So please don't tell Miss Sharon, I don't want to, or this is just how I am. I'm telling you, no, it's not. <laughs> God did not intend for this for you. He wants to give you food. He wants you to drink water. Please drink water. Please eat food regularly. Also, tiredness should not be the norm. Every day we have students who come and they're like half awake. All day. All day. It's not just in the morning. It's like all throughout the day. I'm like, how are you doing today? Tired. How are you doing today? Tired. That's like 90% of the answers. Tiredness should not be the norm. You guys are so young. I was telling this to the seniors the other day. I have two jobs. I volunteer for three organizations. I have a family. I have two dogs at home. I should not have more energy than you. I'm like 40 or 30, many, many years older than you. I mean, come on, right? Our students, you have to take care of yourself better because if you're tired all the time, there's something wrong. Like, there's something wrong. You should not be this tired. It should not be the norm. Self-image. Do not let others dictate who you are and how you look. The only person that should have a say in that is God. So recapping, what is the purpose of high school? It's to prepare you for greater things in life. Let's think of it that way. Not just something to be done with or not something you have to survive. It's a stepping stone. It's leading you to a better place. Let's utilize that. Let's maximize that. Secondly, what do you need to know? There's a lot. There's a lot that you need to prepare. But it takes time and reflection. A lot of reflection and a lot of proactiveness. Nothing falls on your lap. Okay. Well, sometimes things do. But unless you use it to go somewhere, it's not going to be useful for anything, right? How will Eastside help? Man, in every single way if you let us. So can you please maximize what we want to do here? It's not the college you go to that establishes you. It's what you do with the opportunities you're given. It's always okay to change your mind. And God will change your plans. No one can plan for their future. But what we can do is maximize what we've been given in this moment. And while working towards your goals, be faithful in what you have. Think about the parable of the talents. Don't make excuses. Let's go and let's live life. Yeah? Okay. Be intentional. Establish good habits. 
and live out the characteristics you want to live now. Amen? Amen. Bless you.